Hi. Um, but first, thank you for still being here, even though uh, it is a bit more uh, sparse that, uh, than before during the conference. Um, so the goal of my talk today is to present you sidechain attacks for people among you who don't know it yet. Uh, to convince you it's uh, actually a cool topic and that you want to investigate it by yourself. Um, first, a few words about, about myself. So I studied uh, engineering in robotics and microelectronics in uh, Belgium uh, a few years ago. Uh, that's actually not related to security, but I don't know how exactly I ended up doing a PhD on such an attacks in the crypto group from the same university. And today, for a few years now, um, I am a security engineer at Thales Belgium, where I work basically on embedded and hardware security, and uh, also I'm working actively on uh, de the design of crypto devices. I also keep a close relationship with my uh, former department uh, at UCL, UCL now, sorry, the name changes, changed recently. So, um, also for people who Know him, also the brother of David Devo that is sitting in the front row. Wave at the, the people, David, <laughs> so people can see you. Um, the big brother, yeah. <laughs> uh, the context of, um, yeah, for such an attacks, Internet of Things, blah, 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 same stuff as usual. The, the, the most important thing here is that actually now, with the Internet of Things, what is important is that your, the assumption that your, uh, the, you control the environment of your device is no longer valid. You need to, to, to see things differently. And the thing is that it opens gate to a, a whole new bunch of attacks. It's not really new, but it's applicable now. Um, and uh, so in this talk, I present some, some attacks that, uh, an attack in particular, that is labeled usually as academic because people think that in, in reality you cannot apply it, but actually you can, and also with local equipment. So what are side channel exactly? That is uh, what this guy is doing. So it is whenever you exploit information that is coming from a channel that is not a standard input, input or output, you you are performing a section attack. In this case, in this case, this guy is using the sound of the mechanics be behind the button to go faster than basically brute forcing all the possible combinations. Um, when it applies to information security, the most obvious uh, field is uh, cryptography because people uh, usually use it to retrieve uh, the secret keys. Uh, there are many different, many different examples. Yeah, so, these three, among these three. Um, the last one was mentioned uh, during the, the second talk today. Uh, but also it applies to, for other, other things. Uh, people who use it to, to find pin codes or to log key, keystrokes and everything. Also, the disassembler is very interesting. And, uh, yeah, cache attacks. That came back in the front, I mean, the, on the stage with the, uh, the, the Spectre Melder attacks. Um, in this talk, I will, I will talk about power attacks. What are power attacks exactly? So for these attacks, we are taking advantage of the power leakages. Power leakages come from the inner fact that um, when you look at the power consumption, the instantaneous power consumption of a device in general, it depends on both the operation that is executed, but also the data that is processed. And uh, so when you look at the, the measurement of a, of a power trace that is uh, on the bottom of the slide, this is an actual measurement of a cryptographic algorithm. And you can see that we can clearly see these uh, things. If you look closer, and if you have the ability to sort the traces with respect to the to the value, the value of the intermediate the yeah the intermediate values, you can see that there are, that there are time samples where you can clearly clearly distinguish the different sets. So it illustrates the uh, data dependency. 
Um, <clears throat> so since I'm talking about attacking a cryptographic device, uh, we need a case study. For this one, uh, we'll use the AES-256, which is pretty much the strongest uh, symmetric encryption algorithm we have today, among the strongest at least. Yeah, not the 258, as I said in the... Uh, <laughs> I made a mistake, a typo in the um, description of the talk. So this algorithm uh, is processing 16 bytes template, uh, plain text, sorry. So this is a clear text. And it also uses uh, 32 byte keys. So here the goal is to retrieve the 32 byte keys, the 256 bits. And when you look at it, that's basically uh, four main operations that you apply 14 times on the plain text. And at, so every time you apply this four operation, it's called a round. And at every, every round, you use a new key, the wrong key that is derived from uh, the master key. There are two observations that are very important to do. First is that the AES is uh, operating on bytes. So uh, since we are looking at data dependency into the traces, it means that we are we can attack key bytes independently. It is it is super important. And then uh, it is also important to note that the, the two first wrong keys are actually the first half respectively correspond to the first half of the master key and the second half of the master key. So to to attack and to retrieve the 32 bytes of the key we need to capture the two first rounds. So how is the, the attack working? Oh, imagine that um, you are the attacker, you can access the device, you can submit requests to the device. Here I talk about data to be encrypted, but it could be also data to be decrypted. It works both on plain text and cipher text. That's exactly the same. And whenever you submit a plain text, the AES is executing, and then you capture the power trace. So you have you do that lots of time, so you have a set of traces and with the corresponding uh, plain text. The, here you make the assumption that the, the key remains the same for all the executions you have captured. Once you have uh, your collection of plain text and the corresponding traces, for one byte at a time, one byte can have 256 values. You test all the values, you pre-compute the first operation of the AES, you use a model. A model is how you think the values will appear into the traces, and you compute the similarities. And the correct key candidate will be the one that returns the highest similarity with the traces. So it's a bit high level like this, sorry, but <laughs> it's, um, yeah. And uh, then you repeat these steps uh, 32 times to, to get the whole key. So, in the end, you reduce the search space from 2 to the 256 to 32 times 2 to the 8, which is quite significant. And also you can use the set, same set of traces to attack all the key bytes. But the thing is that your attack efficiency depends on lots of parameters, as you can see here. So you, it's um, important to choose them appropriately. But there are plenty of uh, literature on the topic. So. Um, that is the setup. I'll describe every piece of it. First, the target. Uh, for sp so this is a, I mean, I guess that everyone in this room knows exactly what it is. A Arduino Uno with the 8-bit um, uh, microcontroller on it. Um, this is where I've put the, the uh, AES-256 implementation. Um, there is a key that is flashed in it for the attack, and I can submit plain text, and then I receive the cipher text, or the other way around. For the experimentation, I will submit plain text. Uh, it is directly connected to my computer as an attacker, because you know I can to communicate and submit the, the plain text. And for the measurement of the power consumption, we use a EM probe that is very basically a few cores. Uh, copper coils around the plastic rod that we put just next to the um, to the, the power supply pin, 
and with some coupling effect, you you get the, the an image of the power consumption of the device. Um, we decided there are many ways to to measure the power consumption. Uh, you can you can either do that or, for instance, put a resistor on the on the, the power supply. I decided to go for this because first I don't, didn't want to break my Arduino board, and also uh, because I think it's more cool because it's non-invasive. Uh, when you attack it, I mean, you can attack the device without anybody to not uh, noticing it. Um, yeah, I won't go into the details for this, but uh, the, with the probe, you need to use a pre-amplifier because just uh, the, uh, the the signal that comes out of the, the probe is very low. But the pre-amplifier, as you can see, is basically uh, a 10 or 15 uh, passive components. So if you're not afraid to, to use a soldering station, it's uh, pretty easy and fast to, to build. Um, I have everything documented, and I will provide everything at the end. I'll give you the link. Um, and to capture the measurement traces, I use the uh, red pitaya board. That is basically a small embedded lab, and that is it is not very cheap, but it can be used for many different applications. And here I use it as a as a oh yeah, oscilloscope. What is cool with this board is that it can be controlled via um, just TCP commands. Um, so this is the uh, SCPI service. Uh, okay. As, so I prepared the demo. So I'll perform a first attack. Um, corresponds to a scenario where, as an attacker, I can only access the target device where a key is flashed, but I don't know which one, obviously. And what I can do is submit plain text and take the corresponding traces, as I described before. Uh, I measure around 1,000 traces, uh, which takes up approximately 15 minutes to take. And the model, so how I think the intermediate values will appear into the traces, is uh, an amine weight, so that's basically the number of ones you have in your binary representation for the for the values. And as a similarity measurements, I use the Pearson correlation. Um, so first, the uh, capture of the traces. So here, I, every time for every new request, I generate a random plain text, and then I capture a new trace. The first one you see on the top is the row trace. So that is something that is very noisy. You can't see much. But then if you filter the noise and you remove it, that you, you obtain the, the picture that is at the, at the bottom. And um, where you can notice that there are the patterns that start to appear. and if you look, there is a cycle. You can identify a first pattern, a second, a second one. There is another one here that is very small, so harder to detect. But then another pattern, and it corresponds to the four operations of the AES round. And you can see that uh, within just a few traces, it starts appearing uh, very, very clearly. Oops. Yeah, should have done that. Okay. Then, uh, for the second part of the attack, so it took, yeah, I just uh, showed for uh, 40 traces, but imagine that taking uh, a thousand traces, it takes approximately 15 minutes. Then the second part of the attack, I apply my uh, Hemingway model and then the correlation. And this is what I get. So imagine that, that I have my 1,000 traces on one side, so my script loads them and attacks. And it goes, it goes super quickly. It's just a matter of seconds, and I've broken the 256 bits. And, yep. Um, question is, can we do better? What if 
for instance, I can access to the same device because, I don't know, you know that the one that is used by the adversary comes from that manufacturer that you can find on Amazon or something. You buy it for yourself, you, disass you disassemble it, you measure whatever you want, you take the time for, to, for, to do whatever you want and to, to build more accurate models and everything. Oops. Uh, here, so this, so it works in two steps because I have my device on my side before I attack, and with this device I can control everything I want. So I submit plan texts, uh, I submit keys, and what that I chose to exactly know every intermediate values at every time of the execution, and uh, then I can recharacterize very accurately what's happening within my device. Here I use it to just to apply some uh, a smaller heuristic that selects the um, the appropriate points and combine them to extract as much information, the most useful information for my attack, considering the model as you as uh, as you used it before. Since I at the time I use much more traces here, uh, thirty thousand traces. It takes approximately eight hours to, for the measurement and then for the training two hours. But that's not a problem because that's at my place, so I do whatever I want. And uh, then once I have my model, I can go back, see the to the uh, to the target, and uh, the same as before, I can submit plain text and retrieve the traces. Then I apply the model I've built during my my training. And um, so this is the the last demo I have. Uh, here, my attack is a bit different. I do not take the measurement and then retrieve the trade, the, the key. I do both at the same time. Every time I take a new measurement, I update my, the, the, the key that is the most likely, uh, considering all the, all the traces I have. So every time I get a new trace, I have uh, so the best candidates that are displayed, and uh, for every new trace, I update the best candidates. And you can see at the for the best at the best key guess level that the the key that I had start appearing. Uh, it's getting more and more accurate. Yeah, and he is almost done. Just a few, few ones that he has for which he has some difficulties to, to find the exact key candidate. And it's done. Oh, yeah, it's done. Oh. Uh, so, to conclude my talk, um, the problem is not the AES, it was just a case study. Basically, every block cipher is affected, they can be attacked the same way. Um, the cool thing about using yeah, electromagnetic measurements is that the, the, the target can't see anything, it's just completely passive. You, I mean, as an attacker, the only thing you do is submit plain text. But the thing also is that as you can attacks using ciphertext, imagine a case where you would sniff all uh, traffic packets and uh, then uh, if you can match uh, which uh, ciphertext come from the, I don't know, public interface or whatever, you can match them to the, to the port traces you, you got on the other side, then you can, you can do exactly the same attack. Um, and uh, as, as I just demonstrated, this attack can be with, can be done with very cheap materials. It does not require a very expensive equipment lab in some dark university somewhere. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, at reach of everybody, basically. Um, there exist countermeasures. There are a wide range of countermeasures, but usually the more efficient is a countermeasure, the more you decrease the performances of your implementation. It comes at the price, as, as it is written. Um, so the reactions we have is uh, 
the, that it only applies to crypto, but this is not true because as I, as I showed at the beginning of my uh, presentation is that uh, people use it to attack anything that was a secret at some point. And, um, or people say that's only the problem of the uh, hardware guy, which is not entirely true because if you take, for instance, the Spectre meltdown attacks, it was done remotely and it was not only the problem of the hardware guy. So if you want, if you're interested, you want to check the code, which is really messy for the moment, you can go to the, to the first link. Everything is open source. Um, there are more specific boards that has, that are very cheap that add the second link. There are, there are tools that are also available and everything. Uh, if you're interested, there is a free tutorial that is taking place on the 14th of November in France. Uh, you need to hurry up if you want to register. And yeah, for a few re references I was mentioning. And I'm done. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Francois. Um, for the last time this year, are there any questions here in the room? At university, I learned that all the blockchain ciphers, weaknesses, especially to differential power attacks, mm -hmm. could be solved by proper implementing uh, proper C code or uh, the differential power comes from uh, not executing something in an if condition usually or something like that and usually you can fix that by just executing the code anyway and just not me memorizing the result uh, or is this in any way relevant to this or I'm not sure I get your question um, okay uh, okay uh, okay <laughs> Could you <laughs> from the mic? Seems to be. Yeah. What you're referring to is side channel against like RSA, when the computation depends on the data. But here, IS, you always compute the same thing. The only thing that changes is the actual data, and the difference in power consumption is the data that you use. The code is always the same. Yeah, okay. it's replies to. Okay, no, I understand your question. Sorry. Okay, had a question over there. Thank you. I think it's always it's always interesting to bring uh, this material to the people and make it cheap and make make it affordable and so everybody can play with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite frequent, although to use uh, slow and cheap targets for demonstration. Yeah, How sure. practical are these attacks uh, for fast targets, for example, the crypto accelerator on, on an Intel CPU? Um, it's totally feasible, but then, then it requires more expensive equipment, for sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, j just a question, like, uh, uh, does uh, the success of the attack uh, depends uh, how you connect the equipment? So, for example, if you connect it to, like, something which can change, like something like UPS or something which uh, will filter the signal. <laughs> what do you mean? No, no, we said, repeat the question. So, 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 so you... I just missed it the beginning of the talk because I read something, sorry. So like you analyzing like a power. Yeah. So, so and if you connect uh, not directly to the power supply but with some extra equipment like UPS. So yeah. which is supposed to filter uh, this kind of uh, side channel filter yeah, okay, signals. Okay, okay. Is it uh, works? Um so does the way you in connect some cases, the equipment yes. but because the thing you know the in that case, the problem is then that the UPS on, or any other equipment will add noise, yeah. basically. And that's also the problem when you attack, uh, like, and implement this. Because, yeah, of course, here the demonstration is made on a very easy to attack device. And, uh, for instance, if you attack, like, an AES that is implemented on, uh, within an OS that is running on a 
through CPU and something at a higher frequency and everything, it's more difficult. But why? Because it, it adds noise, basically. But also because your traces, you need to synchronize them, so noise in the time samples, but also noise in the amplitude because the data, the, the data buses is much larger. And also you could have processes that pops up at, at any time. And okay, so, but by modifying your power in, supply, you can just uh, increase the cost of the attack. Like, yes. Okay. Yeah. But if I go, if for instance, I took the same measurement and you had any other equipment generating noise on the power supply, it wouldn't change anything because here I'm very accurate with my measure. I directly go to the component I'm, the component I am interested in. Hi. Do you have any idea of the the probe that you built, the maximum working range that that uh, you got? Uh, yeah, we characterized it. Uh, it's on. Uh, where did I put it? Oh, the on GitHub. Let me show you. So everything is available online, as I said, and this is the document where we describe how exactly we build the, the probe and also the preamplifier. And this is the characteristic for the probe. Yeah. So you see that basically it works. The gain is even better if you go into higher frequencies. Which is not the case for the preamplifier. It starts decreasing after uh, 10, 10 mega. So you place it directly on top of the the chip. Um, the probe. Yeah. It's. Um, oh, too fast. Here, just located next to the, the power supply pin. And also I tried to move it a little bit to, to put it a little bit um, further and everything, not with the exact same angle, and it works anyway. It's just that the signal is a bit, um, uh, I mean, there the are more noise and everything. The, the, the global uh, uh, SNR is a bit lower. Thank you. Any more questions in the room? Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much, Francois.